This is an image that I had. I'm sure a lot of you had it too as well when you when you were reading Derrida and as well as other as well as all of the other reading materials I suppose. But Derrida definitely has given me this impression of Jackie Chan going like this, like what? Um, yeah. So I thought I thought I understood Derrida on on a pretty good level because I have sort of written on Derrida before and I, I sort of knew about his his thinking and stuff and but but, but rereading it again today or not today actually I, I read I read most of it earlier today like earlier this morning uh, as a as preparation for today's class and uh, uh, rereading uh, rereading these uh, like stuff on difference and the uh, off grammatology um, instantly off grammatology was I'll tell you a little funny story as people are coming in so I can just share some anecdotes with you just sort of lighten up the mood or something. Uh, of grammatology was actually the main text used in one of the courses that I took during my master's years and I, I took like the first two lessons and they were focusing on off grammatology and I was I was like that, right? I was like Jackie Chan in the picture. <laughs> and I, I ended up dropping the course, like even though I knew the course was kind of useful for me like in the long run or whatever although at the time I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do I mean even now I don't really know what I want to do uh, you know for myself or whatever existential crisis coming in um, yeah so yeah so you know as fate would have it there's there's no there's no escaping I think last week I mentioned I, I purposely evaded Deleuze <laughs> in in my in my time when I was a student and I also I also avoided of grammatology when I was a student and they all they've all come back to haunt me kind of so I just find that to be funny um speaking of that I you know how I put off grammatology like the beginning of off grammatology as like the well not this one or uh in, in the reading materials right in the list of reading materials I put uh well, difference being the the major text and the passage on difference it, it it didn't come from of grammatology it comes from another book by Derrida uh, so that one's pretty useful today we we're, we're going to look at solely we're going to look at that today whereas the of grammatology piece i i'm thinking of dropping that really because as as i was rereading that i i found two things one a lot of the stuff was sort of repeated from what I've read in the Difference piece and in a sort of less developed form. So I I think, I'm not entirely sure, but I think he wrote the book where the Difference chapter came from. He wrote that book after he finished off grammatology. So obviously he would have developed his, his own thinking on the on the concept. It's like, for instance, Difference wasn't, I don't think it was ever mentioned in of grammatology so it obviously the idea was there but it, he, he didn't call it as such so I mean if you're interested in sort of like genealogy sort of thing like if you want to trace it back talking about the trace trace being one of the big terms that Derrida kind of has used that that's sort of that's sort of the thing with Derrida he you can't really pin down like a list of terms that that he has used because he he Quite deliberately, you would say he quite deliberately avoid avoided using um, like all these set terms. Although you have this term difference, which we all kind of associate with him with an os deconstruction. I don't think he called his own thing deconstruction. I think other people just call it deconstruction for him. But yeah, so so you can't really pinpoint you know like pin down some key points or key terms that he's used throughout his career unlike you know people like Freud or Lacan or Marx or whatever where you can just sort of come up with a list of key terms that can sort of associate him with I can't I can't really be brief uh, yeah so um so I'm thinking I'm actually thinking of dropping the of grammatology piece I mean if you are interested in how he came about that idea in in a sort of earlier form sort of thing i suppose you could go back and read of grammatology if you want to if you want to experience this like even more of this then uh, <laughs> then i suppose you could read of grammatology difference the, the the chapter on difference is slightly better honestly because i think he's he's sort of it it's it looks more developed like the the idea of that 
of the deconstruction of the language and the like the relationship between speech and writing it, it's it's sort of it's sort of more developed although on of of grammatology is, is sort of focused on another thing it's focused on the difference between writing and speech whereas difference focuses on the mostly on the critique of the the Saussurean linguistic arrangement signified signifier or the other way around signifier signified chain you know the signifying chain sort of thing chain being another sort of key concepts in thinking about Derrida he hasn't really used the word chain in his, in, in his own work but his his use of the word trace actually has a bit of chain as, a, as the meaning of chain in it it's it's, it, but it's very French you know, the same word ha can have a lot of meaning that's a that's a very sort of Derridian wordplay sort of thing so um so in place of, of grammatology, right, from page 6 to 26, which is the kind of the first few chapters, I believe, I actually swapped in with Spivak's preface of the book because that was that was something I, I realised. As I was reading uh, the Divorce chapter, I noticed none of the things that I thought I knew about Derrida was there. So I thought, okay, they must be they must be in of grammatology then. So I went to of grammatology and read it, and then read it, and it 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 wasn't there either. And then I th and then I thought really long and hard and thought about. There are uh, other books that uh, other books by Derrida I've read before as well, but I don't think I don't think those things that I know about Derrida would have come from those. So I just thought long and hard. Yeah, what else am I missing? And then I thought and then I thought, aha, there's this preface by the translator of of grammatology itself that I remember that I've read so that must that must come from there and lo and behold that's true so I included the the preface uh, which we will start today with is that the right way to put it I don't you know let me just stop share and start a new share right so um, so a bit of a preface for today Kind of like last time, like I like I put it here. Uh, so, so last time, as a preface, I explained sort of Freudian concepts in when when you know, as a as a sort of foundation to to understand Dolce and Gabbana, right? And uh, this time, it's it's the preface of Derrida's own book of grammatology, written not by Derrida himself, but written by the translator uh, Gayatri Spivak, who some of you may know as the writer of uh i don't know whether that's actually called that maybe that's just one section of it but can, can the subalterns speak you know that sort of post colonial musings if you like so he, she's mostly famous for that but she's also the famously the translator of uh derrida's of grammatos for some reason i can't breathe today Oh my god. Um yeah, so she's the she was the translator of all grammatology. So obviously for, by writing the preface she would have introduced her understanding of Derrida. So it was actually her understanding of Derrida that I that I understood and I didn't actually I didn't actually read Derrida directly to understand Derrida. So this is something you can do like for instance maybe this is what you guys are doing right now. Like you are understanding Derrida through my understanding of Derrida which kind of relates to what we're talking about today it may or may not i don't really know i don't really know how today's gonna go um yeah i know i know today today might be the most this <laughs> of all of the lectures that i've done um so that that's the reason why i put this picture up front just uh, just as a sort of warning i think uh, i don't know. now um the funny thing about spivak's preface to of grammatology is the nature of preface itself not the content that the preface talks about but the nature of a preface being a preface which is something that spivak talks about so she so she talks about how uh i think it was um i think it was hegel that that Spivak cites and also there by by extension Derrida also cites uh, Hegel's sort of uh, dislike of writing a preface and 
this kind of resonates with one of the advices uh, speaking of like your midterm essays or your final essays or whatever this is this is this happens to be one of the advices that I would give to students with where which is uh, you always write the first paragraph last because the, per the first paragraph is supposed to introduce your main ideas as, as a sort of summary form and sometimes you might find it really hard to come up with a good introductory chapter but you have already come up with all of the smaller points that the later part of the essay would discuss so why not write those first and then after you finish those you come back to the introductory chapter and then you write that as a sort of conclusion slash summary slash summary incidentally that's also why i named the first lecture conclusion that's actually following the same sort of logic the the preface being preface being the last chapter preface being the last thing that the author right the introductory chapter being the last thing being the conclusion chapter so it's it's sort of it has this sort of um so spivak calls it retrospective nature which you can sort of understand because you look at things retrospectively and then you put that back in you put the summary back into the to the beginning for the reader to read first but that's the last thing that you that you write as a writer so there's that retrospective sort of aspect to it i meanwhile call it cyclical because it, it, it and it's sort of contradictory in a way because it's it's I mean you can you can sort of understand how it's contradictory in itself right it's it's the beginning of something but you write it as an end right it's sort of like how I <laughs> named uh, the the first lecture as conclusion some of you might be scratching your head might be still scratching your head as to why I named the, the first lecture conclusion this would be part of your answer I think um, So from that, from that sort of understanding of the preface, it, it extends to this um, association with this sort of pairing, right? This this sort of binary, sort of almost like a binary pair. So you have the preface and the main text. The preface points you to the main text, right? If you look, if you think of the book, right? You read the pe the preface or the introductory chapter. It doesn't it? It's the same thing. You read the you read the intro. You read the preface that points you to the text kind of like how in the signifying chain which we will talk about in detail later on so don't worry if, I, I know i've i've kept uh mentioning so sure and how you know signifier signifier those kind of things i know some of you may be already uh very well familiar with that uh, conception uh while some of you may not so don't worry i'll, I'll just make the playing make the playing field level for everyone by explaining that in detail later on so the, the the relation between preface and text that sort of related or that sort of equal which is why i put the equal sign there the it's sort of equal to how the signifier points to the signify in the signifying chain for those of you who already know it the, the preface points to the text the signifier points to the signified concept and this um according to spivak and by extension Derrida himself this this sort of um, equal sign is what the Hegelian concept of the Aufhebung I don't speak German but I think that's that's how you pronounce it or in English I'm some of you maybe may have heard of this term before sublation um, it's sort of like a made-up term that that Spivak came up with as a, as a sort of translation of the Hegelian concept of having something sublated don't worry if you don't understand what that means because the next line I, the next line would try to sort of attempt to explain that in a little bit or sublimation making something sublime that's that for me is not quite not quite an effective translation but it, it, it sort of has that meaning as well I don't know uh, I think the German word, as they explain, Spivak and by extension Derrida, it explain when they explain this this term Aufhebung. Uh, it literally means lifting something up, but it also has connotations of uh, conservation, so keeping something and and a negation, a sense of negation. So it it sort of has this almost like contradictory. Um, tendencies within that same word but it the word means you know it, it I suppose you can you can call it like making something sublime so like taking something to the next level ie the lifting up of things 
So making something, I don't know, to put it in plain language, maybe put it putting something more understandable, make it more concrete, that sort of thing. I, I think I think that's fine for you to sort of understand it that way. Um, actually, let me look at that. Because uh, I think I want to look at this. I want to look at this for now. Uh, oh. OG doesn't mean original gangster, obviously, it's of grammatology. Um, so if you recall, I don't think whether I've explained this, but the dialectical relationship, which which I sort of used as as a as a Marxist sort of uh, relationship or Marxist sort of theorization, right? That the dialectical way of thinking how there is a thesis and an antithesis so there's a positive way of looking at things and a negative way of looking at things and you combine them together that's actually not a, a marx thing that's that was that was, actually, that was actually started by hegel because hegel influenced marx uh so the dialectic is a, is a process of alfie bung so you could you could sort of understand this concept of alfie bung as this you know this sort of contradictory two contradictory uh tendencies coming into you know coming together right the negative and the and the positive and forming something sublime right um every concept is to be negated and lifted up to the highest sphere in, in in which it is thereby conserved in this way there is nothing from which the alphibon cannot profit however as derrida points out so derrida finds something about this alphibon concept problematic there is always an effect of difference or oh, okay don't worry if, if you don't know this yet just keep all of this in mind as we go along I, I think i'm i'm sort of using you remember how i said this whole thing is cyclical right cyclical meaning the you know you have the cause leading to the effect but if it's something that's cyclical then the effect would cause the cause itself and then the cause would lead to the effect so it, it kind of goes around in circle and it's difficult to determine which to put first kind of like that sort of very old philosophical conundrum like the you know whether the egg comes first or the hen you know it's kind of like that the hen and the egg is sort of cyclical right? you don't know when you don't know which one to start from right you don't know you don't know whether to start from the hen or to start from the egg so this this is why this is why i'm starting it feels like i'm starting in the middle of things like i'm in, i'm already using the term difference without even defining it but it it's sort of like i'm using the hen to explain something but the hen needs the 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 egg to explain but then you know the reverse would be true as well if i start with the egg then i'll have to explain it with the hen um anyway so there is an effect of difference when the same word has two contradictory meanings kind of like alphibon the, the the word itself it's it has lifting up as is literal meaning but it has connotations of something that goes in the opposite direction kind of like the whole dialectical process um Indeed, it is this effect of difference, the excess of the trace. Just bear in mind these these terms, trace, difference, whatever, alphibon itself. That is precisely what the alphibon can never alphibon. Al al alphibon. I don't know. I don't. I don't speak German, honestly. So uh, this is a very Derridean. I mean, you could you could almost see. You could also see similar tendencies in, in, in Deleuze as well, like all these French writers, they have this sort of thing, like they, they use this, the word itself to critique the word. So, it's, so they're, they're saying like the, the Alphibung, this, this concept is the one thing that it can't do is, is itself. So Alphibong is Alphibong is the is the concept that says that there is there are these two contradictory tendencies that can come together to form in, to form this dialectic and form something that's sublime, right? But um, Derrida is, is introducing this concept called difference, which has a has some meaning associated with difference. I mean, you can you can see the difference in in the internal conflict of the word alphibong right you have lifting up and then you have sort of going down or negation whatever so you have this difference and this difference causes the term itself to not be able to do the, the term itself i don't know if you, un if you understand that right the term itself has the the same problem that the term itself describes and the term itself can't solve that problem i don't know it's it's all very confusing i don't know you, if you are if you already like this I'm sorry, but you have to bear with me.
as it goes along, I think it will be easier because then I'll, I'll, I'll you know, introduce something that's something more easier to understand. Like when it, when we, when we get to the the social and all that sort of thing, it might be easier to understand. And then maybe, maybe when you come back, then then you'll understand. It kind of has that sort of three step thing that I talked about. In, you know, the Zen thing, <laughs> sort of like that. You you look at the mountain, you see you see mountain. You look at you look at uh, you look at water, you see water, and then you have this second step when nothing is what they seem, and then the third step is kind of the same as the first one but you get a different understanding in my hen versus egg example you understand the hen first but then you need the egg to understand the hen so you don't understand the hen but then i introduce the egg to you and then you think back you look back at the hen then you understand the hen so it's a hen egg hen kind of relationship i don't know so we so we're done with the first hen bit i think i, I should probably stop talking um Go back to Derrida now. Uh, deconstruction is the thing that he's most famous for, but what the hell is it, right? Deconstruction it is um, one way to look at it is that it is against logocentrism. Uh, so I looked up uh, the dictionary, or at least online websites of the dictionaries like Miriam Webster. They have this websites. So I looked up the the explanation. I think it's sort of okay, but I like this one better this is this is the definition that came from my own little dictionary app that comes with the, the computer if I could drag it out here and it says it's from Oxford I don't really I don't really know whether this is true but we'll just go with that because I think that's the easiest to understand the logocentrism regarding words and languages as fundamental expression of an external reality, especially applied as a negative term to traditional Western thought by postmodernist crit uh, critics, which is kind of what we are here in this course. We are all postmodern critics, and we are critiquing this idea of using uh, words and language as a fundamental tool to understand things. Right? That's logocentrism or lo logos, right? Logos. In in English, logos means the uh, the picture, right? Like kind of like your your icons on your phone. Those things are all logos. That's 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 how the word is understood in English. In in, in Greek, logos with an S. That that's actually a word in Greek as well. And in Greek, it can mean reason. So it's sort of I don't know whether that does that to you, but it sort of resonates with what we talked about during week three. When we talk about when we talk about this thing called reason and how reason isn't really reason, so logocentrism, reason centric, and how we sh how we should uh, sort of think against reason centric thinking. I don't know. Uh, deconstruction is not quite the how the word is constructed, right? It's it's not it's not the opposite of construction. So definitely not destruction is not it's not breaking something deconstruction isn't breaking something although it kind of is part of it is breaking something but it's it's not just destruction deconstruction is still kind of a construction so uh but definitely con not construction either right because otherwise they would have just called it construction straight away rather than deconstruction so it's something that's neither destruction nor construction uh Construction is an, another word for construction in our context would be structuralism, i.e., or for example, the Saussurean semiology that we will talk about later on, or you know, kind of the, the Freudian understanding of the unconscious, which we may talk about later on today as well. So, those kind of older ways of understanding how the world works which are very ordered, very structured. You have all these terms, one term meaning one thing. You have a system of the different terms. You can just slot everything very neatly into place. That's structuralism. And in this sort of context, you can understand structuralism as construction. And deconstruction is definitely to go opposite to that sort of tendency, but not to be confused with destruction because we're not trying to break everything. We're still trying to build something. Uh, if you recall last week, this is a point that I forgot to mention <laughs> last week. I, some of you who stayed behind and asked questions, they, they 
ironically they actually got to hear this bit because I, I was like oh this is a this is a point that I forgot to mention but anyway I'll, I'll just tell it to you now to everybody uh, you remember how schizophrenia uh, if you have read the reading because I haven't I haven't really uh, mentioned this last uh, last time so uh, schizophrenia according to DNG uh, it's sort of a counter production but if you remember how the 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 starting point their starting point was that everything is a machine that produces things right so everything is a uh, a production so schizophrenia is kind of producing something as well which is sort of ha what they what they mean by uh, adapting a schizophrenic way of thinking because it's it's a it's just a different kind of production so by calling it counter production they don't mean exactly to stop production or to anti the production right the, the the exact opposite of production they're not they're not they're not saying that uh, uh, Buchanan who I used as a secondary reading for for the for the Deleuze he actually put it in a more obvious which by extension makes it less obvious because it, it's, it sort of makes things even more confusing. Uh, he puts it anti-Oedipus is not so much pro-revolution as it is anti-counter-revolution. So you see this is there is a sort of double negative thing going on but by going double negative it, it doesn't mean that it goes back to the original thing. Kind of like how you know the three-step Zen thing I keep mention I keep referring to right the third stage of understanding when you look at a mountain you see a mountain you look at water you see water that's not the same understanding as when you first saw the mountain and the water so when you anti then counter the revolution it, it's not the same as the original revolution which was the uh event the 1968 uh movement Right. That was that was sort of the backdrop of um, of uh, why Deleuze and Guattari they they wrote that they wrote those two books kind of at the back end of the of the failed revolution. It was failed because nothing really changed after that revolution, and so they was they, so they were thinking of ways to. They weren't exactly opposing revolution, obviously, because the status quo is not something. You know, we need to break away from the status quo. So there, there has to be a revolution. But the revolution, in in the first degree, right, and on on the first stage of that three three stage Zen thing or the, the hen egg hen thing, if you if you prefer that, you know, it, that's that doesn't work because of May sixty eight. It didn't work. So instead of countering it, you you sort of play a double negative on it, and it became some something else. And that's sort of similar. That is a similar way of understanding what deconstruction means. So it's not destruction. You 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 sort of put a put a double negative on the concept of construction. So you kind of break up. You break down the construction, but then you um, sort of put it back again. Kind of like yeah, kind of like that. Like imagine a, a set of Lego. You 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 see a, a complete set of Lego. Someone someone finished building it. You just sort of you smashed it into pieces and then you build it back again. But you, when you build it back again, it, it's not the same as the the thing before you smashed it. So, so yeah, you could you could argue that there is a element of destruction in there as well. I, yeah. Right. Another thing that the um, the Spivak preface uh, mentions, but not so much in difference the the chapter in fact uh, the chapter itself it it hasn't mentioned this thing once although it has used it it has used it which is why I'm mentioning it here it, it's used it on let me just find it for you it's pretty early on it's uh can't remember exactly which page it is but I mean for those of you who have read it you would have you would probably have uh, noticed there was there was some words or maybe a word that was crossed out and that wasn't that wasn't an accident that was actually Derrida himself crossing out the word ah, on page six um, why am I looking at it here and I'm not here uh, no go away yeah Jackie Chan go away uh, page six right you see this thing here right so he's doing this thing now if difference 
is, but he's crossed it out. And he also he he even puts brackets here explaining that this is in the printing era or something or someone does a uh, vandalism sort of thing on on your book, right? It's it's actually Derrida himself who crosses it out, right? So this is sort of doing what we what I just explained, like putting a double negative by putting a cross across the word. Obviously, you whoever crosses out the word negates that word, right? So it's anything but this word, right? But by leaving this whole thing in here, rather than rather than just deleting the whole thing, by by leaving this whole arrangement, you have the word and then the cross as well. By leaving the whole the whole thing in here, it's it's sort of. It's sort of saying that part of the crossed out word is still there, right? Part of that crossed out word, part of that meaning is still here. So it's 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 sort of playing that double negative, right? By by putting the cross, it's negating that, but by leaving it, by leaving the whole thing here, it negates that negation. So, but it's not the same as having the word itself without it being crossed. So, um. So Suhatcher is uh, actually a, a Heideggerian. I don't know whether that's French. I read it as a French, but Heidegger was obviously German, and I don't know whether whether he actually used the the idea as a French term or maybe he he he, he translated that into German. I don't really know. But it's it's you know just think of it. Think of the English. I think under erasure is is sort of sort of literal translation. Uh, I don't know how to, but Su is definitely under. Um, it was originally Heideggerian concept and adapted by Derrida himself. And obviously, Derrida, uh, Heidegger is uh, famous for having written this book called Being and Time. And being, being, <laughs> being, being one of the the biggest ideas from from Heidegger. Right? What what is being? Is kind of his whole project or being or, or that or, or Dasein da Dasein I think I think that's fine just just leave the just leave the cross there it's it's a uh, it's unfortunate I can't I can't actually put the, the actual cross there I can I can only just put like a like a horizontal line because that's that's what the the software allows I suppose I can create an, an object there but that's just too much too much uh, trouble for me to do I, I think you understand the you understand the concept of it anyway. You cross this something, you cross the word out, but you leave the whole thing in. So you're not exactly crossing the word out, right? Um, it has something to do with the the uh, Derridean idea of the of the trace. This word trace has been used in many many places in the in the Difference, uh chapter. And one way to understand, well, obviously it's a trace. You can understand it in the English meaning, right? It's 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 trace. But in French, it has other meanings, other connotations. It has like meanings like track, uh, path, imprint, footprint. The print is actually very important for for Derrida, but not in this context. In, in other contexts, uh, print, and also later the the chain. So it's sort of like a. It's a path. It it sort of it has a linear sort of connotation to it it has a line sort of feel like a, a, a you know chain path track all these things it, it's got a it, a feeling a connotation of a line a route uh that sort of thing and you see it the trace in doing that crossing out is the process of doing that right so first you have the word and then you cross out the word that's the second step and then the third step is you leave the whole thing in so that whole Activity that whole enterprise has left this trace in, and this is the trace that this trace, this idea of the trace, because you can trace it all the way back to its beginning by looking at this this whole arrangement, right? You see what you see what the author has done. You can see that they've first written the word and then they crossed it out and then they left it in. So you see you see all you see all of that. Uh, you see all of the history. Of the term happening, and that's sort of what Derrida means, the trace. And uh, as Spivak mentions, the, the 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 word trace can substitute uh, with other terms that Derrida also uses, like archi. No, I think it's i. I think it's autocorrect. Uh, archi. No, I think e is fine as well. But anyway, it's something to do with archive. It, it's uh, archive being one of the, one of his sort of one of Derrida's 
um, one of the things that he's interested in, like the idea of the archive, right? How how something is being stored, how like you could you could sort of see the relationship because he's the one thing that he's interested in is is writing and language and in, if you think about writing language, it's sort of a way to store idea, right? So it, it sort of has that that archival sense to it. But uh, archie writing and difference itself, you know, the term difference, you, according to Spivak, who is like one of your top. Derrida experts, not this person here. Obviously, you, if you wanna, if you wanna understand more about uh, <laughs> Derrida, obviously go to people like Spivak. I don't know whether she's still living. I think she is, though. I don't want to Google it. No. Anyway, um, yeah. So according to her, um, these these words trace archi writing, which I believe you 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 encounter this this term in in the in the chapter once or twice. Uh, if you don't know what the hell that means, you can just, according to Spivak, you can take up Spivak's advice and swap these terms freely, right? Even difference, the the big term that we are looking at today. Um, right. So finally, to to finish this uh, very confusing first section of today, I I, I I've uh, located this this quote quite late into the chapter the, the difference chapter and it reads the trace is not a presence but the simulacrum of a presence that dislocates itself displaces itself refers itself it probably has no sight erasure belongs to its structure and not only the erasure which must always be able to overtake it but also the erasure which constitutes it from the outset as a trace which situates it as the change of sight and makes it disappear in its appearance, makes it emerge from itself in its production. So I think the simulacrum is not the operative word here, but it, it, it sort of is in our context, in this course's context, because we have talked about simulacrum, like simulation, all that sort of thing previously. And I thought it might be a, a good sort of segue, a good sort of link to, for you to think about between these two, to link these two, two things together like Derrida, the, the Derrida the Derridean concept of difference or Derridean concept of the trace and how it's related to simulacra right this is something that I I hope you've seen I, ho I hope you've noticed this is something that I'm, I'm trying very hard to do throughout every lecture that I, I try to find uh, connection between the, 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 the reading materials or the, the, the ideas that we talked about from different weeks and I try to sort of sort of link them together and to try to make you see in a more confused way <laughs> yeah kind of because I, I make I make the network of understanding sort of way more complex rather than rather than a linear fashion I made it into a I suppose if you if you know Deleuze it, it's it's a rhizome it's it's a, like a spider web kind of thing instead of a, a single line I made it into a spider web sort of arrangement hence making it even more confusing but maybe some of you like this confusion I don't know so simula uh, simulation of a presence just think about just sort of keep that in mind as I as I eventually explain to you what difference is I know it's kind of strange with of, of using this term over and over again without actually giving you the definition but that's sort of how how Derrida likes it, I I would like to think. Um, so, this is sort of part two. Uh, difference, what the hell is it? It's spelt. It's sort of a. It's sort of a spelling mistake. Um, you know, if you have read the the difference chapter, you can sort of you can see it uh, that he sort of make this admission. Not so much an admission because it's it sort of it's sort of um, obvious, right? Of course, if you replace the a. Right, if you replace the A with the E, then you get a difference, right? I know it's it's the French word, it's the same. The French word is the same spelling as the English, so it, it doesn't really make a difference. Um, although it's pronounced differently, which is why I've been pronouncing it that. Uh, difference, right? A instead of the E, it's sort of a spelling mistake, although that was that is a deliberate spelling mistake. Um, Derrida calls it a graphic difference right because it looks different of course because the a looks different than the e obviously so it's a graphic difference 
but that's as far as the difference ends because it's it's only written it's only look it only looks different it doesn't sound different that's what Derrida likes about it right because this is the reason why I like to I like to pronounce difference right uh, like in in the in the French way of pronouncing difference right or you could do you could do what Derrida has done in the in the chapter itself because I believe the chapter is like is his uh, lecture I think it's just a a, 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 a transcription of, of a lecture that he gave somewhere so in the lecture because it sounds the same because the two terms sound the same he he had to make some sort of clarification of which term he was using so he was at at some point at many points in the in the chapter you would see there are brackets saying with an a and then with an e so it's difference with an a difference with it with difference with an e I would I would call it that, or I would just I would just say the the French pronunciation difference, uh, uh, difference, right? Um, which is why I don't really get it when some people you might have come across it, you might you might have come, come you might have come across it before, like some people who pronounce it uh, difference, kind of a mixing of English and French, which I sort of understand, but you know it, it sort of it sort of defeats the whole point. It defeats Derrida's own intention of having it sound the same, right? So you might as well call it different, right? Because then it sounds the same, but it's just spelled differently. But by by saying it, by 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 pronouncing it difference, it kind of it kind of breaks down the entire arrangement, the 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 sort of uh, play on words type of game that Derrida tries to that Derrida tries to play there. Um, so I don't know. It's neither a word nor a concept. Um, it's not even a word. Right? It's it's kind of hard to understand it. It it it's so it so is a word, right? It's a word that you can read on the on the reading. But according to Derrida, it's not a word. It's not a con. It's not a concept. It's uh, it's something else. It's got many meanings, right? Because in ah, oh, this is the most important thing. Right? I'm sorry, it's it's taken me uh. 45 minutes to get to this point but I I wish I could have start I could have started from this honestly but I don't know I just I just thought starting it from here with with the preface kind of like how Spivak herself started her own translation I thought that might be interesting I don't know I wish I could maybe some of you wished I, I would have started from this so this is the one thing if there is only one thing that you would take away from today, it would be this, right? Uh, difference. What is this? Difference with an A, right? Dif difference with an A. What is what? What is that? It's derived from this uh, French verb, uh, differ, right? To to differ, and it the it it loses that connection in English, but in French, it's directly related to his Latin root word. Which I'm not gonna, I don't know, differe or something. I don't know. And that Latin word actually has these two meanings: to defer and to differ. So this is something that is completely lost in English. Even even if you just spell it, uh, you know, with a different with a different letter in the middle, it, it kind of it loses that that sort of um, subtle difference in meaning entirely right so to defer right one so one half of uh difference right to defer to defer means um of course the def to defer means to delay something right you you want to you want to put off something uh you delay something that's to defer right and on page eight of the chapter derrida talks about this thing called temporization and you might think temporization has something to do with temporal, right? You might thought it makes, it's it means to make something temporal, i.e., to make something related to time. But it, there is another term for that. That's temporalization. That's what that means. So temporization. What does that mean? You look at the, look in the dictionary. It says, avoid making a decision or committing oneself in order to gain time, i.e., defer, right? Um, so temporization kind of looks like temp uh, temporization looks the same as temporalization, kind of looks similar. So it, it's sort of a, a similar thing going on, which is why Derrida is 
sometimes he's very fun to read that way because you know, he's he's playing with these all, all of these sort of like word games and stuff and if you if you notice them it's kind of fun but then obviously because we are reading English we're reading the English translations of some of it may may get lost but luckily you have translators like Spivak although Spivak didn't translate the Diffelon's reading it's uh, somebody else who whose name escaped me although it's never really entered into my consciousness to be honest um, right so you know he you know it's, it's playing something similar temporization and temporalization one is to make something temporal the other is to defer, right? To defer. So, to, in any case, that act of deferring it has this dimension of time in it because you're delaying something from happening. You're delaying to make it happen at a later time. So there is a relationship between present and future, or past and present, right? So just keep that in mind. I don't. Um, or as Derrida puts it, the becoming time of space or the becoming space of time kind of making time as a space or making space as a time i don't know if you if you understand that then you will you, if you don't then i guess just just drop it i don't know um to differ is the other half of difference and to differ is easier way easier to understand it means to it means different right it means the word different that we all understand right the the ordinary understanding of that word uh, early on, he uses Derrida uses this this sheaf as a as almost like a visual metaphor, and I didn't know what a sheaf means. I looked it up. I still didn't know, and uh, because it's a visual thing, so that's not a sheaf. Obviously, that's just uh, an idiot. A uh, sheaf is something that something that looks like this. So you have grains. You have these um, you, when you farm these. Um, grains and then you just you, you cut them off right when when they're when when they're ripe and you cut them you cut them off then you use a you use a string to to tie them up and what Derrida is going for with this visual metaphor is this cutting and tying up at the same time right you see because these two tendencies are kind of op opposing to each other right you cut something off means to separate something but then if you tie them back together you're making them together again. So I don't know. That's that's just that that's sort of how I understand it. So that's kind of what difference is. It's is is it's been that confusing thing that I, I've I kept um referring to. There's two opposing tendencies going not against each other but going going together. Right. Um so how is or how difference relates to or how does difference relate to uh, the postmodern to put it bluntly it's it's sort of giving you tips or not because it's all very confusing so it, it all depends on how much you understand it um, you're giving you tips on how you can how you can answer one of those one of the uh, midterm questions that I suggested you don't have to follow them I think if we have time at the end of today we might talk about that uh in the in the last 10 minutes or so um so how's it related right so you can you can sort of see glimpses of how that works in some of the quotes that you can find in the chapter right uh some of, some of them are here right this I, I believe this is page seven as well uh difference which is neither a word nor a concept as we talked about before strategically seemed to me the most proper way uh the most proper one or a way to think what is most irreducible about our era. He uses this quotation marks to to mark our era, which he hasn't really explained. There's no footnote or whatever, but we can we can sort of assume that he's he's he means today, as in the as in the time when he was writing, which sort of is the same round about the same period as we are now in twenty twenty one. It's it's. I mean, he he was writing it in the late sixties, early seventies. I no, I think late sixties, around about the time when the revolution, uh, May sixty eight, not revolution because it was it was failed. So movement, right? That movement was um, sort of underway, and one way to look at our time is that it it post modernity kind of started around about that time. So we could look at this era that he talks about. 
as the same era that we are living in, and it might be convenient for you to think of to think to think of it that way. It is only on the basis of difference and its history that we can allegedly know who and where we are and what the limits of an era might be. I don't know. You might you might want to go back to page seven to to sort of think about what this era means. I just saw I just saw, I just saw the word era coming up twice in this same in on the same page, and I was like, because I've I've always this is what you guys should be doing. Right? When you read something, you don't read it in a vacuum. You read it with a purpose, right? And when I was reading it, I was reading it with the purpose of trying to serve this this class, right? I'm not. It's I don't know, I guess if you are sort of more advanced as a student, you might find this advice more more useful. But when you read something, you don't you don't serve the author. It's something that we always accidentally it's it's a trap that we always accidentally fall into. Right? When we read something, it because it's so brilliant, then we all we all automatically um accidentally follow this author that we're reading. We follow this author's way of thinking and we, we sort of we become them and another way to explain that is we serve their purpose but when you do research when you write a paper whatever it's your purpose that's the most important thing right so you you want to flip that 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 script and you want them to serve you right you want your your author to serve you so here i'm making derrida serve me right <laughs> derrida is my servant and because he's mentioned the word era, and I thought it might be convenient to think of this era as our postmodern era, and we slot that in. It it sort of makes sense. So I don't know that that kind of makes that kind of flips the script of uh, of who's who's serving who. I don't know whether how much you understand it or not. Like, I guess if you get more advanced, you might understand it. Um, Right, and later on, uh, using difference to to think about people like Nietzsche, Freud, and Levinas, I have to I have to confess the the things that he talks about in the in the latter part of the chapter on Nietzsche and Levinas. I have no idea what 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 he's talking about, but the but the Freud thing, I kind of did. And if we have time, we may actually get to exp explore some of the things that he he say he says about Freud using his idea of difference, right? You, because last time, it, it's sort of it's sort of a cool callback to last week as well, because last week we used schizophre it's schizophrenia as a framework, as a new framework to understand Freud, right? And this time we could use this other framework, which is difference to understand Freud, which also makes sense, you, which obviously it would because, you know, it's Derrida who makes it work, so obviously it would. Uh, so this network of, um, you can almost say it's a network of these modernist uh, thought, right? A network of these modernist thought, and you reassemble, which reassembles and traverses our era, again, the mention of the era with the quotation. Again, no idea what he means, what he meant when he wrote this in the first place. But to my eyes, with my own purpose, with my very specific purpose, when I read it, I can only read postmodern era. That's all. Right. Um, reassembles and traverses our era as the delimitation of the ontology of presence. This is sort of if you, I mean, if you have, uh, oh, I, I, I. I make I made the Jackie Chan go away, but if you if you can bear that Jackie Chan going what experience, just if you can just bear that for just that little bit longer, and then you get to the end of that chapter, then you you notice that uh, Derrida doesn't stop at just uh, commenting on the nature of language and like signify or sig signify whatever. He's he's actually extending that way of thinking by means of difference to thinking about presence, thinking about ontology of presence. Another way to describe that is the Heideggerian being, or you know, just all these sort of existential questions that you may have, like why are we here, or what is what is existence, right? That sort of thing. You could you could almost swap these questions with Heideggerian being as a as a first port of call. Because I myself haven't quite understood Heidegger myself. I haven't really read Heidegger myself, but so this is sort of my sort of basic understanding. Uh, 
I suppose I can sort of say a bit more about Heideggerian being like he- Heidegger. Obviously, Heidegger being one of the most important philosophers. He's not. He's not like the. He's not just some guy down the pub, you know, just having having one too many, and he, he just he just said, "Oh, why are we all here? Right? What is the purpose of life?" Blah blah blah. He's not just he's not just blurting out pseudo important stuff like that. Of course, he has a he has an actual he has a genuinely important question to ask, which is the which is this thing ontology of present, which is the um, the nature of being, right? Because you you first you have First, you have Descartes, right, and which also has relationship with Nietzsche, because Nietzsche also Nietzsche kind of extends that Descartes or that Cartesian uh, dictum in a way. You know, I think, therefore I am, right. Uh, so for for Descartes to explain being is the the thinking, right, because that, because we all think that explains our being, right. We what is a being? It's 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 some it's something someone that thinks right. It's kind of Descartes' treatment of it, which by extension is sort of how Nietzsche treats it as well. But Heidegger uh, kind of Heidegger go, goes one step further, which at the same time is kind of go one step backwards because he's 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 looking at the question that should have been asked before that question, before asking what is being. And uh, he's he's sort of thinking he he's he's sort of uh, hypothesizing that there's something that should happen. There's something that should be there before being even can be there. I don't know whether that that kind of un- that kind of explains it. Or I think I put it somewhere in this note. Like it's the questioning of the question of being. I think that's that's probably a better way to put the Heideggerian question. Right? It's it's always. It's it's easy to question what is being, right? Why are we all here? What is the, what is the purpose of our lives? Blah blah blah, right? But the questioning of that question, I think that's what uh, Heidegger focuses on. So it it sort of has. I don't know. Now that I think about it, it doesn't. But when I was preparing these notes, I kind of did think that it had. Right? It had this sort of. I thought it had this sort of uh, cyclical relationship as well, because you have this. Um, I think it kind of does because you, if you can define what is being, right? If you can define what is being, then you can define that questioning of the question of what is being. But before you can answer what is being, you need to answer that question before it. But to answer that question before, you need to put it after, sort of like the hen egg hen arrangement. I don't know. You have to take my word for it. I can't really explain it further because I. Don't quite know how. Um, anyway, where am I? Uh, yeah, this one. So, uh, so let's look at difference again uh, as a temporization, i.e., the, the deferring, and as a spacing. The spacing here means the difference because there is a. It's almost like there is a gap between two different things because when you have two things that are the same, they overlap, right? Then there is no 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 space between them. But when you have two things that are different then they're separate and there is a gap right there is a gap between so it's it's what is called the spacing right and how are they joined right this is the question posed by Derrida on page nine uh, so all the previous pages page one through eight they're all kind of rubbish <laughs> I have to look at them no, no. so he talks about the sign and you know this is where we start to talk about the Saussurian linguistic kind of arrangement the sign represents the present in his absence Right. What the hell does that mean? Don't matter. Just carry on. Uh, it takes the place of the present when we cannot grasp or show the thing. State the present, the being present. When the present cannot be presented, we signify. We go through the detour of the sign. Uh, the sign is the detour. We take uh, we take or give signs. We signal. The sign in this sense is deferred presence. Right. So think about. So I put an example here. Uh, I said he as in me. So let's say, let's say I I started this Zoom session, right? I turned on my camera, but this person isn't here, right? So I'm, I'm sort of, you know, kind of like, kind of like this, right? I'm not here, and 
it's it's past four thirty already. Class has already started, but the person isn't still isn't here, right? And you know, some of you may be typing in a chat, or maybe you you turn on your mic and you ask other people, "Where is he?" Right? There is a he there, right? Where is he? That he is this sign because I'm not here, right? There is no there is no thing to point to 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 point to this this very thing that you want to describe is not here. So you use something else. The he, the word he, to describe this this blob of existence, right? And that's a de- that's a deferral because I'm I'm not here yet. And when I arrive, then the he no longer functions. The he kind of the, the function of the he is finished. It's it's it, its job is done because you do, you no longer have to ask where is he, right? Because I'm already here. So there is no there is no he already. I'm already here. And I don't know whether whether that makes sense or not. <laughs> right. So the he is the sign. You can think about you can think of other signs as well. Anything can be a sign. Um, oh, you have a you have a thumb. Oh, we have a thumbs up. Who gave that thumbs up? Thank you very much. Oh my God, I'm so glad. Tiffany. Yeah. Oh wow, Tiffany. Uh, yeah. So the he is like the sign because I'm not here. So you use this word to to describe this person. Or you can use my name, right? My name is like a sign as well because my name isn't necessarily myself. My name is something else. You could, or actually, my name has that sort of Derridean thing going on because my name is pronounced the same as that certain Star Wars princess as well, right? <laughs> you could sort of, you could sort of play a Derridean relation there as well. It's like, which one are you referring to? Yeah, I don't know. So that's what is that is that is what is meant by classical. Uh, semiology in the Saussurean sense. I don't know what, why did I not put Saussure's, ah, there you go, uh, yeah, Saussurean semiology. Why did I Why did I put it here and not there? Uh, the substitution of the sign for the thing itself, right, because you use the he to substitute this person, right? The substitution of the sign for the thing itself is both um, secondary and provisional. I kind of, I sort of explained that already. Why is it secondary? Because the he is not this person. This is primary. He is just secondary and is provisional because as long as I, as soon as I'm here, you don't have to ask where is he, right? The 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 he, that's that's just the provisional, a temporary function of the he, right? Um, this is the bit that I, even I can't quite understand, but I suppose we should we sort of need to power through this. But the question of um, this substitution of the sign and you know the sign not being the very thing itself, you know how this is all um, deferred and stuff, and it leads to the question of the origin or the originary something. I put originary something. I, I sort of did a Derridean trick here. I put the I put the brackets here, and the brackets actually do mean something. Uh, in in Derrida, he 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 describes it the originary difference doesn't matter just think of it as the origin uh in our example the origin you can sort of think of the origin as this person right because when you ask where is he there is an origin that you can trace back to the word he which is this person right the so the signifier becomes the sign when the actual sign layer is absent but therefore there is a deferred presence yeah pretty much it because because my presence is deferred so uh the signifier becomes the sign I don't know I'm kind of confused because signifier is sort of the sign itself I don't know doesn't matter um, but you are you sort of understand what the deferred presence mean right because I think my my example kind of works very well like I'm because I'm late I already turned on my camera but I'm late so I'm not here you need to ask where is he my presence is deferred when I arrive here the he doesn't have that function anymore you don't have to ask where is he anymore and and Derrida is saying that this whole arrangement, right, the sign, this sign assumes a presence, right, that, that, that there is an authority of presence, that like this one, one kind of presence is more, it has more significance than another type of presence, which you could sort of understand, right, you know, if you have, if you compare the he, the word the he and this person, right, then this person obviously is, it, it, this person takes more significance. In this sort of signifying chain, right? Because this is the thing that you want to you want to describe, right? So the he itself, 
or whatever the he means in other sense or whatever Leia means in other sense it could mean the, the Star Wars princess or whatever you know all those other things they they take on a less level of significance whereas this person is the most important or you know, having this authority of presence right to and that that whole thing leads to thinking about formulating the meaning of being the being of this person in general as presence or absence right which kind of works in my example because you, you 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 rely on this whole understanding of w where is he in or what is he right what is what is he or who is he or you know when is he going to arrive that sort of thing the he relies on this whole understanding of presence and absence right and Derrida is saying that this is sort of a wrong way to understand things kind of like what we talked about last time I think I put it somewhere in the in the in the in the notes but it doesn't come up here can't really understand my my ordering but anyway I think we'll get to that a bit later so kind of like last week when I said uh, D and G when they when they thought of when they thought about um, Freud right Freud Although I don't think that's quite Freud. I don't know whether I've, we've got time to talk about this today, but that's not quite Freud. That's for me. That's lack on like the, the lack and stuff. Like you know, have you have a desire and then you, you're lacking something. So this is an absence of something. Right? The lack means absence of something. And Derrida, no, Deleuze and Guattari, they are, they are saying that this whole thing about this play between presence and absence, it it's it doesn't doesn't quite make sense because one thing is more important than the other kind of like the normal way of thinking is more important than the schizophrenic way of thinking right if i put it that way you understand it right and they want to make everything fair i.e the schizophrenic thinking is as is as important as the normal thinking they're not saying that that's more important they're just saying that that's equally important they, they take on equal significance right so by thinking by thinking of things in in terms of presence and absence there is automatically there is this connotation that the present is the is the better thing right you have this binary uh, arrangement where one is better than the other right um yeah let's just move on because that's something that this youtube clip would talk about which you know as it happens all the time other people will explain it way better than i do so i'll, I'll just give the job to other people uh heidegger according to derrida is, uh, the question of being must be liberated from is traditional metaphysical domination by the present and the now a kind of kind of an extension of this right the question of being uh the question of consciousness or whatever you know question of whatever it should be liberated from this traditional way of thinking of presence and absence there's something that is there something that isn't there just sort of keep that in mind i don't know um the Sushirian way of semiology kind of like what we just said there the sign and everything it's it's a, it's uh according to that theory the Saussurian theory language in language there are only differences uh this is a very famous famous phrase that a lot of people cite but not a lot of people actually understand what it means uh it's language is differences without positive terms i.e only negative terms Dif differences between something that they're not right so the word is the word means something because it doesn't mean other thing. Uh, the word he means this person because it doesn't mean some some other person. I don't know. You'll understand better when when I play this clip. I think uh, the the signified concept is never present in and of itself. Every concept is inscribed in a chain. Uh, this is a this is a much more difficult concept. When when we when we, when we come back to the concept of trace, we might get a better sense of it. But this you can sort of understand it, right? The signified concept, i.e., this person, right? The signified concept is never present in and of itself. When you say he, right? Where is he? The the he because the he is not there obviously the he is 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 never present when you need to use that when you need to use that sign to represent that signified concept so this, the concept itself is never there so it's it's sort of a it's sort of a way to to understand why to understand how language is according to a Saussurian way of understanding is is, is language ba language is based on negative relations it's based on absences right when you when you can only understand the he when I'm not here, right? 
kind of, I don't know. Let me just play this clip and that would sort of uh, clarify things. I don't really know. Uh, five minutes something, because there's something... Ah, there's something about this clip that I don't really agree with, but I think after five minutes something, I think it's it's fine. Saussure, teaching in Geneva at the beginning of the 20th century, said that meaning in language is produced by signs which have two sides, a signifier and a signified. The signifier is the word or image, sounds, writing a picture. The part that is sensed as an input by the brain, like the sound tree, the picture of a tree, or the written word tree. The signifier points to a signified, the concept of a tree. The signified is the idea. It cannot be a real tree because people refer to different trees when they say the word tree. It's the shared human idea of a tree. For Saussure, the signifier and the signified are united in the brain like two sides of a sheet of paper. He believed that what gives signs meaning is the differences between them. Cat, for example, means cat because it's not a bat, mat or gnat, and that it's given meaning because of its relationship with dog, mammal, four-legged animal, fur, pet, catwoman, batman, the list goes on. All of these are part of a structural network where signs all point towards each other to give each other meaning. Take a look at a dictionary. What do you see when you look up the definition of a word? Different words. And when you look up those, more words, until eventually you're back at the first word. Derrida took this idea and built upon it. He said that not only were signs dependent on each other for their meaning, but that other signs were always present within the meaning of a single sign by what he called their trace. Take pig, pink and big. When you say or think pig, other concepts, signs, signifieds and signifiers are literally present in the sign itself to define its meaning. The sign pig is also partly pink, big, small, dirty, farm, pork, ham and animal, among a thousand other things depending on the person. All of these concepts are neither present nor absent in the signifier pig, but are identifiable in the concept by their trace. Derrida wrote that the trace is not presence, but is rather the silicrum of a presence that dislocates, displaces, and refers beyond itself. The trace has, properly speaking, no place, for effacement belongs to the very structure of the trace. Trace is part of what Derrida termed difference, which means that meaning impossibly exists in the space between signs. He said that difference is the systematic play of differences, of the traces of differences, of the spacing by means by which elements are related to each other. This spacing is the simultaneously active and passive production of the intervals without which the full terms would not signify would not function. Derrida's fundamental point with all of these terms is that language is hugely subjective. Meaning differs from reader to reader, time to time, and so there cannot possibly be a shared truth that we can all access through one theory, philosophy, or institution. On top of this, Derrida thought that much of the tradition of Western philosophy was based upon binary oppositions where one term or concept is given primacy, said to be more natural, have more of the truth in it over the other. Right and left, male and female, inside and outside, high and low, speech and writing. Many writers, consciously or not, write as if there is a hierarchy where one term is presumed more fundamental than the other. Taking all of this into consideration, we can look at Derrida's most famous work, of grammatology which we won't because it's too difficult and it's too much of a distraction so that's it i hope that this dude has explained to you kind of you know some of the things that i try to explain like this binary relationship this is the reason why it's not good to think of 
the relationships in in terms of presence and absence because there is a there is one one right and one wrong right and if you all remember how i said there is no right or wrong that's sort of the postmodern project which is why i grouped derrida as being a postmodernist himself you know in this sort of tendency of treating everything as equal right? there is no right or wrong even the the supposed wrong answer can be a right answer uh so that's 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 that uh I don't like his pronunciation of of difference, obviously. Uh, that's the same sort of. That's the same quote that I used. Uh, so here, he I think he explained this. Um, you know, the trace, the trace of the word, the Derridean trace of the word is not is neither a presence nor an absence. I think he explained this pretty well with his example of the pig, right? Of course, obviously, he, you would have you would have you would have thought about these all of these things. You just don't know it, but it, because when you think of pig, you don't just think of pig. You think of like I don't know, many other things, or like these, right? Ham, pork, uh, the p- pink, or maybe the babe. The film that's that's where I would go to, right? Um, so, like he said, different people have different association. I suppose association is a better way to to sort of describe this. So, all of these things are sort of there when you think of the sign pig, but the sign itself. Doesn't have those things, right? It's so it's it's sort of a it's sort of both, right? It's sort of both present in the sign but absent in the sign as well. So I I kind of find this to be a better example than myself. Um, this dictionary thing, I really like this like, because it it kind of helps me explain the the cyclical nature that I explained pretty early on in today's lecture. This this thing would this sort of cyclical. Uh, process would 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 come up every now and then when you think about all these it, not just Derridean thought but other postmodern thought postmodern philosophies or whatever this sort of cyclical why is it cyclical because when you look up a word it's explained by by means of other words and very often when you look up when you look up a word in the dictionary and the dictionary usually uses some other difficult words that you don't understand to explain the word that you want to look up in the first place so you go and look up that other word right and when you look up that other word very often uh it might happen in two or three times it might happen just the next time you look up the the second word right when you look up the second word it uses the first word to describe to to explain that second word right so it, it kind of completes that loop i don't know whether i don't know whether you have experienced that before uh maybe give me a thumbs up when you have when you have if you have experienced that before when you try to look up a word you end up looking <laughs> okay thank you thank you very much who is this oh tiffany again uh thank you um you know it's it's something that happens it's something that happens to me uh oh rummy as well thank you thank you very much um so you see what this sort of like cyclical relationship goes on in even in in sort of everyday life and the way to understand it is it's sort of by means of difference kind of i don't uh let me just go there very good illustration oh very good illustration of the spacing as well because he he has this sort of graphical explanation right he's, he's using all these different dots to to link up all these different signs right and by and and between these dots there are these lines right so you can think of difference as the line itself and not the dots but the lines that link between the the signs it's sort of a very good illustration uh, i don't know um so this is what this is kind of what Derrida calls grammatology instead of semiology. So it kind of builds upon uh, Tsushurian semi- uh, semiology, and he calls it grammatology. But uh, the book itself, it's it's talking more about writing. It's of the act of writing, and it's it's sort of one way to look at writing is that it is a signifier of the signifier. Right? If you think of language, is already being a signifier itself. Right? There is this there is this idea that you want to express but you can't express it so you use language to express it so the language itself is already a signifier to signify the thing you want to write and then you write it right you write it using language it's sort of like it's it's already doing another signification the writing is if you think about it if you agree with Derrida's thinking writing is a signifier of a signifier which means it's not really effective at all I don't know um 
this incidentally kind of reminds us of the language games, right? If you recall the, the Leotard lecture, I think it was week four. If you remember the language games and, uh, you know, how, how the language games end up being just, you know, a play of discourse and this play itself, uh, on the surface, it tries to explain scientific knowledge or whatever knowledge, but it ends up being just a play of the language games, and you know it doesn't amount to anything. That's sort of what that's sort of Leotard's idea. But in Leotard's arrangement, right, the language games, every player of that game they know the rules, right? N nobody would break that rule. That's the whole point of playing these language games. So, like every scientist, when they write the scientific report, they know exactly what kind of language they would they need in order to write the report. And you know, lang language. Now, Leotard is arguing that by having the scientists writing that report with a you know with a certain way, right, it ends up being the whole enterprise ends up being the writing of the report rather than the presenting of the idea itself, because the idea would have to conform to the writing of that report, right? So it, it has to conform to the language games, right? So I don't know, I just suddenly think of a, I just suddenly thought of an example, like think of Federer playing tennis, right? And maybe Federer suddenly wants to paint a picture. Maybe maybe Federer wants to paint a painting, but he can't paint a painting in the game of tennis because that's not within the rule. So if somehow Federer comes up with an, with an idea of how to paint a picture, he can't in that game of tennis, right? So it's it's sort of what happens in science. That's what Leotard is arguing. So there's something, some might otherwise important things might have been missed in the playing of language games, right? Um, so that, but but the, the the main difference is that every player of the language games they know the rules, whereas in Derrida, as the guy in the in the YouTube video explained earlier, it's subjective. So every person's uh, interpretation of the of the rules of this game is different. So everybody's sort of playing a different game, and the difference that difference is sort of what Derrida is saying. So it kind of breaks the whole Leotardian language games down a little bit. If you want to put those two together, and that might be an interesting way to think about things I don't know and uh, PK oh speaking of PK that film that I recently discovered that that uh, Indian Hindi film that I sort of used last week as, a, as an example and this week it, it kind of comes up again because when I think about it if you have seen I have uploaded it on on Moodle I, I would highly recommend you guys to, to watch it too it's unexpectedly it actually works pretty well it, it works very well to think about the ideas we've been talking about these past two weeks right in, in the in the dng week and in this week as well in dng you have this figure of the alien thinking in a completely different way than a normal human person so you could argue that the alien is a schizophrenic person so that fits last week's topic whereas this week's topic he uh, he actually very the, the alien the character the alien character actually very explicitly describes the nature of language and he says you know in in his uh, species there is no language because there is no need for it because in in his own planet everyone communicates by sort of telepathy and there is no need to say things because by saying things I think he explains it like, as well like by making it into language it it creates a translation error almost and there's a there's there's miscommunication and the uh not side effect but, I suppose, but yeah the side effect of that is everyone that comes from his planet cannot lie right and if you think about it if you use language you can lie right because language why can you lie precisely because language doesn't mean the very thing that you want want it to mean right if you communicate with others kind of like pk's own people and you know, they all communicate with telepathy then there is no there is no need for language but I get, there is no existence of lies as well right? speaking of lies i think spivak in her preface he actually calls preface as a lie because all prefaces are lies i can tell you, all introductory chapters are lies every book i can guarantee you every book that you've read every every book every preface every introductory chapter they would have they would have been written last right so that causes the lie right <laughs> because by calling it preface by calling it introductory chapter whatever it it has that 
connotation that you have to read it first, but the author hasn't read it first, right? The, the, the author wrote it last, right? Of course, you can argue writing and reading is two different things. So you could argue it's not it's not so much a lie, but I quite like the fact that Spivak calls it a lie. And yeah. Anyway, where am I? Uh, probably should move on and sort of slow. But I think yeah, I think we've catched, we've, we've caught up. Uh, I quite like this phrase from Derrida in the in the Diffehans chapter. They have not fallen from the sky fully formed. So the the difference between signified and or signified and a signified, right? The diff the, the the relationship between or the relationship within that signifying chain, right? The, it 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 they have not fallen from the sky fully formed. And by that, he means that these are man-made, these are produced, these are manufactured, right? Differences have been produced, are produced effects, but they are effects which do not find their cause in a subject or a substance, in a thing in general, a being that is somewhat present, thereby eluding the play of difference. What is written as difference then will be the playing movement that produces, uh, by means of something that is not simply an activity, these differences, these effects of difference. This does not mean that the difference that produces differences is somehow before them in a simple and unmodifi unmodified indifferent present. Difference is the non-full, non-simple, structured and differentiating origin of differences. The name of origin no longer suits it. So it, the to I don't know. I want to say to clarify it, but at the same time to further complicate it is to sort of carry on with our um, with with our overall theme today, like this contradictory uh, you know relationship that happens or the cyclical nature that can happen when we think about stuff like this. Right? Uh, what what he's sort of saying, what he's hinting at here is that by thinking about the this signifying chain, right? Because they these things, like he said at the beginning, which is why I like this very much, right? They have not fallen from the sky fully formed. They are they are man made, right? So first, so you know, I would just use my later example. I don't I don't I don't think I have time to wait. Uh, so apple is the word apple is that, right? Is is the red fruit, or it could be green, could be yellow. I don't know, but it's it's the fruit, right? But this relationship, it didn't. I can say you know we can safely say that there there was a beginning to this right there must have been a first person who called the red fruit apple right the red fruit itself didn't tell people that i'm called apple right people have to have come up with the name apple so there there must have been a day where there must have been a day when that fruit wasn't called apple and then just one day somebody decided that this fruit is called apple right do you, do you see what i mean right so there is a there is an origin to that relationship right and by thinking of thinking in terms of origin it it kind of flips the cause and effect chain uh in reverse kind of like the hen egg thing right it you know apple 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 or the, the fruit doesn't really matter you know, apple comes before the fruit or the fruit comes before the word apple and it, it kind of confuses with that cause and effect relationship and what Derrida is saying is by thinking of uh, difference right which has a a time dimension of it and the space dimension it thinks of it thinks about deferring and differing right that's the that's the origin of differences and origin itself it doesn't it doesn't suit like it says here it doesn't suit this whole argument because by thinking like like for instance if you think about um the origin of the egg right which one is the origin there's no answer to that so obviously the the idea of the origin when you think about the egg and the hen right it doesn't it doesn't fit you can't think of you can't think of this problem in terms of origin in terms of cause and effect, in terms of all these traditional way of thinking. But by difference, I can't quite adapt the way of difference in, in thinking about hen and egg, but you, you could you could sort of swap, you could sort of slot uh, egg and hen in this diagram that this guy has written or drawn, 
right? It's just part of a of a bigger network of things, and there is no first, there is no last, right? There is no beginning, there is no end. Everything sort of happens at the same time, and it kind of negates the need of thinking about origin, which. I don't think we have time to talk about this, so I'm just I'm just going to give you give you the fast version of it. Like f- the whole Freudian enterprise, right? The psychoanalysis, or whatever. It's just looking for origin. If you think about it, right? You know, there is this person, you know, having these mental issues or whatever, and the the psychoanalyst, what is he doing? Well, what are they doing? They're finding the cause of the mental illness, right? So they do they're trying to find the origin of that illness, and if we apply the different way of thinking about things, then there isn't an or- there isn't an origin because the the cause is the effect itself, kind of. And a cause and effect doesn't apply, uh, even though we're looking for a cause. I mean, we're look we're sort of looking at the. I mean, by deconstructing here, we're deconstructing the semiological arrangement by looking at it. We're sort of looking for the cause. Are you looking for the reason for this whole? Uh, linguistic uh, signifying chain but uh, this is what Derrida says we then would have to speak of an effect without a cause uh, I have attempted to indicate a way out of this closure of this framework via the trace so it's it's pretty much repeating what I said um, you know, if you think of origin then there is a hierarchy you know the, the word that this guy used right the hierarchy of things right presence absence there are there's a hierarchy the presence is higher than abs- absence right if you think about the origin there is a hierarchy there is an order there is an order of things right one thing happened before something else so the hen happened before the egg but i think that's the best example i can come up with because if you if you say the hen comes before the egg that definitely is wrong because you could you could flip that around and that would still work. So that contradiction, that conundrum, is almost is almost proof that there are things in this world where cause and effect just simply doesn't work anymore, and it can only work by means of a trace. Uh, I mean, you could you could think of trace. I mean, if you look at the word trace in this ordinary like English meaning then you would think you would say that oh this is just this is like a, a police investigator trying to trace uh you know the killer's step or whatever is trying to trace back to the origin hence it, it's sort of a, a a counter argument way to tell you that that's not what Derrida means by trace right what Derrida means by trace is is it's absolutely something else it's not that linear arrangement anymore. That linear arrangement, the cause and effect. It's not to trace back to the origin. It's it's print. It's the imprint. It's the footprint, right? If you recall one of the uh, one of the meanings, one of the French meanings of the word trace, right? You have a certain sense of print in there. It leaves a mark. Right, the trace is not so much that linear relation of cause and effect, but it's it's sort of a a leaving a mark. Although leaving a mark can be a cause and effect in this way. I know it's very difficult, but it's it, the whole thing. Everything in everything in this course is kind of difficult because it, because it kind of breaks. It it attempts to break. We are here to attempt to break free from what we know, or the only way we know. To know things, I don't know. That's that's kind of a very clumsy way to look at it. But you know, cause and effect is very easy, right? You, you all think of cause and effect, but there are sometimes there are things that cause and effect just just doesn't work, which works very well with my own research interest of time travel. Because I, when I when I think about time travel, the, the the one conclusion I can draw from thinking about time travel is that cause and effect just plain doesn't work, right? You have things like superstition and luck you know all those kind of things right you have i I don't want to offend anybody but you know the the whole like tradition of going to the temple and you know pray to god or whatever pray pray to pray pray to the god and pray that uh you know he would you know give you lots of money it's sort of one of those traditions traditional lunar new year celebration kind of thing right it's it's all I mean, you can call it tradition, but if you think that it's all useless, then that's fine. 
right? If you think that it's all just just all facade and it's 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 all done for the spectacle of it, it's not it's not done with its actual function in mind, right? You're not actually going to the temple to actually ask for that money, right? That's <laughs> to ask them to 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 lend you like billions of 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 dollars or whatever. That's sort of part of the tradition, right? And you know, there's no cause and effect there. You don't you don't do something and then that leads you to have this luck of you know landing a, a large sum of money or landing a, a good job or whatever. The cause and effect lies somewhere else. That's one way of thinking about it, right? Superstition is, if you think about it, superstition is the wrong way to attribute cause and effect, right? The the solution to get out of that is to look for elsewhere to look for that cause and effect chain or kind of following Derrida's way or even Deleuze or whoever to scrap all that altogether. Uh, yeah, I don't think this is relevant anymore. Uh, difference thus are differences thus are produced, deferred by difference. But what differs, or who differs? Right? What differs? Who differs? Or more generally, what is difference? So we are already, we are almost at the end of today's class, and we still haven't asked that question. Quite asked that question. What is difference? Right? But here, Derrida is sort of, sort of give you a, a final slap on your face, because if he he says if we accepted the form, if we accept this form of the question, right? Who differs? what differs or what is difference, what is, who is, where is, or whatever. And this kind of makes an assumption that there is a there is a definitive there is a there is a, a concrete way to define what dif what difference is. And it sort of goes back to that whole cyclical nature of it. Right. Because you need to know in order to ask this question, you sort of need to know that there is it is sort of there in the first place right because if you don't if you know it, do you know what i mean like the assumption is that there is this thing called the definition of difference which is why you ask this question right you ask what is difference because you have made that assumption that there is a there is a definition of difference i.e that assumption leads to the existence of that definition already so it kind of it kind of forms that same loop the the hen egg hen thing right the the definition comes before you even ask the question and according to the Derridean way of thinking that that's that's why this whole enterprise I keep using the word enterprise I don't know why this whole act this whole process is wrong right? kind of like, kind of like how he says the whole cause and effect way of thinking is wrong. Or not wrong, you know, because there's no right or wrong. But it's it's you should think of an alternative way of thinking about things. Um, consciousness of the speaking subject language not being a function of the speaking subject. So this is a Saussurian, uh, this is a Saussurian thing. So in Saussurian linguistic, the 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 function of uh, the language is not a is not a function of the speaking subject because lang because the self-consciousness of the speaking subject is kind of already inscribed in the language itself kind of like the pronouns if you think about it when you said when you asked where is he right where is he or when i say i am the lecturer of this course then the word i already has that embedded uh self-consciousness in it, so it, it makes that same sort of cyclical thing, right? Because you know, I haven't even def I haven't even defined my self consciousness, but but by using the word I, I I've already I already did, but I haven't. So it, it sort of has that contradictory cyclical nature of it, which is why this whole thing kind of doesn't work. Uh, which is sort of which is sort of what Heidegger did. With the whole thing about being, so being is to ask that question, right? What is being? Everybody can ask that question, but to, to even ask that question is to have assumed that being exists, or, or being is something that you can you can use the the operative word what to explain or to to ask the question. So 
Ah, this one I really like, but I don't know whether this is actually related or not. But this is one of those very famous examples that that are associated that are associated with Heidegger. So think about the hammer that you use to nail some nails on, like on some wood or whatever. And Heidegger, I'm not I'm not entirely sure how in what context Heidegger uses this example. I I just find this example illuminating in thinking about this sort of. Contradictory nature of things, right? So when you use the hammer to hammer the nail, right? You don't think of the hammer. Why? Because it works. Because the hammer works. When the hammer works, you don't. You just get on with it. You don't look at the hammer. You don't think about the nature of the hammer, right? What is a hammer? Why is a Why is a hammer a hammer? Why does a hammer need to be in this shape? Why not another shape? Why does it have to be this heavy? You know all those sort of existential questions about the hammer. You don't think about them because you are doing the job. Right, you're hammering the nail onto the onto the wall or whatever. You that that thing works because the hammer works. Then you don't think about all those questions. It's only when the hammer doesn't work, then you start to think about those questions. Right? When you think about it, the hammer doesn't work, the head of it falls off, or the hammer is not heavy enough. The the nail keeps spending. Right? For those of you who have done your IKEA. <laughs> bookcase assembly whatever sometimes you have a crappy hammer or you or or the person hammering it is is crappy then your nail would bend and then you can't really nail the board into the into the other board then you start to question it right you question why is it failing right so when the hammer works you don't make those you don't ask those questions and it's only when it fails then you start to ask those questions so does that mean that when it's working, then the nature of the hammer isn't doesn't matter anymore, right? It only it's only when it fails then it, it then it matters. You know, you see where that contradiction is, kind of, right? The same thing happens in um, in Freud, right? This is this is a bit that is found in not in your reading, so I have to sort of uh, you know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how many of you actually go back to the reading to read things after lectures or whatever. Maybe you just forget about the whole thing. I don't know. But this is from uh, Writing a Difference in the chapter called Freud and the Scene of Writing. So he talks about, the Derrida talks about Freud, right? Uh, an unsuccessful repression on the road to history. I'm just, I don't, I don't want to, uh, maybe I'll read this. On the road to historical dismantling. It is this dismantling that interests us. This unsuccessfulness, which confers upon its becoming a certain legibility and limits its historical opaqueness, repressions that have failed, right, will of course have more claim on our interests than those that may have been successful. For the latter will, for the most part, escape our examinations. This one is easier to understand. Maybe as easy as the hammer example, right? You know, if you have repressions that are working. Then that patient will no longer be a patient. That person would just be living normally. They wouldn't have a nervous breakdown. They wouldn't have hysterical so and so. They wouldn't have what was that word called neurosis. No, that's a psychoanalysis, psychoanalytic word. They wouldn't suffer from neurosis. So they wouldn't go to Freud to talk about their problems, right? And then Freud wouldn't know about their problems. Freud wouldn't know about their. Repressions in the first place. That's not to say that they have repressions within them, right? It's to, it's actually ironically, you can say that the repression is working really well in those people. It's so well that they don't have to go see Freud, right? So Freud can't look at those cases. When when you think about it, when Freud wants to look at repression, wouldn't wouldn't it be wouldn't it wouldn't it make more sense when he looks at the successful cases rather than the unsuccessful cases, because if you think about it, well, all he looks at are the unsuccessful cases, right? The unsuccessful uh, moments that re you know, repression breaks down. It's because when repression breaks down, then you have all these like mummy issues, daddy issues, Oedipus, blah blah blah. You have all these things happening, right? It's not to say maybe I have those issues as well, but I don't. You know, I I make you know, the repression within me. It, it's it's working fine. That's why I don't have those problems. That's why I don't have either this complex or whatever. Maybe I do. I don't know. I really don't know. But that's the whole point, right? The repression works. It, it wouldn't it make more sense when he looks at when the repression works, right? But by it, it sort of recalls that relationship, um, you know, before you know, cause and effect or a hierarchy of presence and absence, right? Language is one of those things, 
right? The Sussurian arrangement of language is it puts the it puts the emphasis on the absence, right? And here, the Freudian project it puts the emphasis on the failure, on the absence of the success of repression. And when we look at the hammer, when we actually think about the existential problems of the hammer, we we actually that's predicated on the absence. Of a successful hammer, and you know that isn't that all very ironic, right? So I don't know. That's sort of interesting to think about. So you know, all these examples that like, they sort of point to I don't know for Derrida at least it points to the the need to think about to utilize this concept of difference, which can't quite be defined because it's not even a word nor a concept, like Derrida said. Which is why Derrida has attracted probably the most criticisms that any famous uh, philosophers have attracted in the history of philosophy. Maybe him and Zizek. I don't know. Yeah, he's he's attracted a lot of criticism. Like a lot of people are saying. I think there is. I think there was once this letter signed by academics all over the world and saying they they should like kick Derrida out of the. Philosopher's circle. If there was ever such a thing, <laughs> they they didn't want to accept Derrida as one of them. Like you know, because for for them, Derrida is saying nothing but rubbish. He's saying something that doesn't make sense at all. But I don't know. I kind of like the guy. I kind of like this whole sort of postmodern. It's very postmodern. That's the main theme of this course. Right? To get rid of the traditional way of thinking, which is you know that which puts you know there there are there is there is hierarchy and if you really deconstruct it then you see these ironies at play and when you see these ironies and you you find a, you will realize that these old ways these modern ways may not be the the most effective ways to look at things but if you post it right you post you use postmodern ways you question the ways themselves right rather than having the ways Taken for granted, then you start to see things more clearly. Yeah. Right. So you know, come back to the Sussurian linguistic thing, which is the easiest thing today to understand. Right. The apple means that red fruit. Right. Um, but difference. What difference is doing is trying to deconstruct this relationship. While so this. So what does this deconstruction lead to? Right. After the deconstruction, the apple is still. The red fruit, obviously, we wouldn't say the apple is an orange after deconstruction. That would be stupid. So the apple is still that fruit, but at the same time, apple is not that fruit because if you think about it, it's apple is just a sound that we make by linking the two syllables together. The two syllables have nothing to do with the fruit itself. It has nothing to do with the taste, with the shape, with the You know the vitamin makeup. You know the <laughs> the you know nutritional value. The your your even your emotions towards the fruit or I don't know the brand, the brand. You know, nothing to do with that, right? It's just the sound that we make. It's uh it's an artificial relationship that we we forged to towards this this red fruit. Right, so it's at the same time. So by by way of deconstruction, we deconstruct this relationship. We don't take this relationship for granted, but while we we still agree with this relationship, because apple is definitely that thing. It's not an orange. It's not a pear. It still it still works. It's still an apple, but we just add an extra layer of that understanding in that it's it's kind of the opposite of the original understanding, which is apple is not the red fruit, or The other way around. The red fruit is not an apple, but what is it then? It's still an apple, which is kind of why it's so confusing. It's not an apple, but it is still an apple. I don't know. I'm not here. But I'm. I'm also here, which is kind of true, though. If you think about it, I'm. I'm referring to my my example of where is he earlier on. <laughs> I'm not here, but I'm also here on this whole Zoom arrangement. You're all here, but you're you're also, you're also not here. So the the whole Zoom experience is in in a way very Derridean, very postmodern as well. I don't know. So that's the end. That's every. That's all I've got for today. So, uh, I hope you guys have. Uh, 
I don't know. I think the whole sort of Jackie Chan thing is still. I think that's a fun experience to have, right? You know, to be this. <laughs> to go like this is actually a very good experience in a way because it, it it kind of it's it's at the it's the moment when the hammer doesn't work right it's the moment when the repression breaks down so it's the moment when you actually question your own understanding right like you know when Jackie Chan goes that what he's actually in a way he's actually questioning his own intellect right his own ability to understand things right so i don't know just wanted to ask about the essay are we free to choose yes oh i'm sorry i'm so sorry so i like i promise uh the the essay uh midterm essay um you are free to choose whichever concept that you want to focus on but um even those at the tutorials i don't know anything about the tutorials but i kind of i kind of have this uh i don't know i kind of want abel fazel to 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 take the reins i i, I give him full entire freedom because when I was a or when I am I still am when I am the tutor I kind of hated it when <laughs> well I kind of loved it at the same time it's very Derridean I loved it and hated it at the I love it and hate it at the same time when the when the lecturer tells me what to do or what to expect during the tutorial so I, I don't know but yes you can choose whatever topic you want but the, the whole the main purpose is for you to explain the concept I think which is why it's so short it's, it, you're not expected to develop from the concept you, you you just stop at the level of understanding the concept that's it to expand on the concept to uh, adapt the concept to something else something else that you've noticed something new that's the that's the purpose of the final paper so i kind of want to make it a a two-step sort of thing sort of progressively work towards a better understanding of the postmodern way so the first step will be just to understand the concept itself obviously if you if when you when you explain the concept you want to bring in some examples you can but you don't have to expand on the examples too much you just briefly explain it that would be fine um yeah i don't know don't no worries i i'm just i'm just worried i'm usually worried that i, I made i made people more confused which is sort of a good thing in the context of this course, but you know, this is why, this is why I I I'm, I, I sort of struck luck <laughs> when when I got the opportunity to teach this course, but not other courses. Although I am teaching other courses, so you you may have to ask other people whether they are confused in those other courses as well. <laughs> then I have no excuses, right? I have no excuses there, making other people confused. Anyway, any other questions or comments? Uh, how many of you are going? like that at the moment like what <laughs> uh, yeah uh, I don't know Aaron Aaron's giving me a, a thumbs up uh some someone raised a hand uh some some Yi Wong uh go ahead you can type your you can type your question you could unmute Oh, you raise your hand, but when because you you are oh, you want to you want to tell me that you have this experience, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah okay. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I got, I got it, I got it. Yeah, okay. That's good though, right? That's sort of the first step. If you if you can't even do that when you read Derrida, then what are you, right? You know, that's that's all. That's pretty much the first step you have to go through when you read like Deleuze, Derrida, pretty much everybody we cover. But I think that's. I think it's a bit of a good news because I think we've covered the the difficult parts, the difficult bits of this course now. From here on in, it, it's gonna be easier, which kind of makes me question of whether I should flip the order next time I get the chance to teach it. Like if I, if I should introduce those practical stuff first before I do the the, the theory stuff. But I don't. Know, I kind of like the way it is. Kind of like putting the conclusion before, <laughs> kind of like putting conclusion as the first lecture. Kind of flip the order. I don't know. Anyway, um, have fun with the uh, midterm papers, and I'll see you after the reading week. So, good luck and goodbye. <laughs>